Hello, and welcome to the Aquarius Podcast, your source for interviews with people from all across the tropical fish keeping hobby. I'm your host, Randy Reed. Please subscribe and check out all previous episodes on Podbean, Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes, or AquarisPodcast.com. You can also check out additional content by following the Aquarius Podcast Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. If you like what you hear, please rate and leave a review for the show. Enjoy the interview. Today's date is Tuesday, May 8th, 2018. My guest today is Dr. Jay Stauffer, Jr. Dr. Stauffer is a distinguished professor of ichthyology in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management at Penn State University. His academic area of interest include endangered fishes, freshwater fish behavior, impact of introduced fishes, and systematics and zeogeography of freshwater fishes. Dr. Stauffer, welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. Thank you. So, Dr. Stauffer, um, I, it's been a, a, you know several episodes now that where I have wanted to bring on an ichthyologist onto the show um, and talk about a couple different uh, subjects. So, thank you very much for for coming on. So, my first question though is, um, are you a home hobbyist uh, aquarist? I started out as a home hobbyist when I was in seventh grade, but now I'm traveling too much. I don't have any fishes at my home, but I have about 5,000 live fishes in my lab here at the university. Oh, wow. That is incredible. So to, to go back then in the seventh grade, uh, what was that experience like? If you could kind of walk through what kind of fish did you keep and um, you know what kind of tank setups did you have? Well, it got started. Um, we used to have these weekly readers that came around. Uh, every week at school, and there was an article in there about whether fish were colorblind. And somebody had dissected the retina of a shark and found cones, which are color cells, as well as rods in the eye, and concluded that fish were, in fact, could see color. And I thought this would be a new experiment, so I taught my parents to get me a couple of aquaria, and I went to the local fish uh, store and bought guppies and started breeding guppies. And I took apart my train transformer and hooked up one of the aquariums with two wires. And when the guppies were released, the babies were released, I'd put a guppy in a tank. And I stole all my mom's food coloring, which I got in trouble for that. But I dyed half my food red and half of it blue. I put a piece of red food in a tank, and when the baby guppy came up to sample it, I'd give it a shock with my train transformer. And when I fed it blue fish, blue food, then I wouldn't shock it. And it got so I could, I trained about 20 fish that I could put in the tank when they were uh, juveniles and sprinkle red and blue food on the top of the tank, and they'd only eat the blue food. And that's how I got hooked on raising fish and having home aquaria. Wow, that is incredible. And that was around the seventh grade that that you did that um, that set up an experiment. Yeah, that was when I was in seventh grade. So, so I guess from there, um, how did then did your education progress uh, to to becoming a professor in ichthyology? Well, I I continued to raise fish, lots of different fish, um, and. I read it when I was in high school. I read about Ed Rainey, the ichthyologist at Cornell, with a consulting group that started a consulting pro- program for Peach Bob Nuclear Atomic Plant and Muddy Run Pump Storage Reservoir in the Susquehanna River, which is about 30 miles from where I lived. And so I wrote to him and asked him for a summer job. And he wrote back and said they only hire students that were already in college, but if I ever got interested and got to college, give them a get in touch with him. So then I got a, a job as a counselor at a Boy Scout camp, and three days before I'm ready to leave for Boy Scout camp, Ed Rainey from Cornell called me up and said, look, one of these college students backed out on it at the last minute, and if I could would still be interested. He couldn't pay me very much money because I was in high school, but he paid me $16 a day in room. The Boy Scout camp was paying me $16 a week in room and board. 
And so I said, I have to get back with them. I called the Boy Scout camp, and they said they had lots of people want my job. So then I worked, went to work with Ed Rainey at uh, Holtwood, Pennsylvania, studying fish. And I got to know a lot of people that were undergraduate and graduate students studying fish. I got to meet Ed Rainey. Um, and I spent my summers working with fishes on the Susquehanna River, learning to identify them, studying their behavior, their life history, uh, age and growth factors. And then I applied to Cornell and went to Cornell and studied with Ed Rainey as a freshman uh, in 1969. Wow, that is phenomenal. So that, that sounds like just an amazing chance opportunity that really, you know, sets you very firmly on your on the path that you're currently, or the, the, the path that you've taken, rather. That's true, and I always maintain it's better to be lucky than good, and I was lucky. So <laughs> I got a chance to study with him at Cornell, and then um, I graduated from Cornell in three and a half years, and I had an opportunity to interview with John Cairns of Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. It was called VPI at that point. And uh, I went down there and completed my doctorate work uh, at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University with Ken Dixon and John Cairns. So I'm curious for your undergrad and uh, and your graduate, what were your uh, what were your I guess cornerstone capstone projects uh, for both of those degrees, if you can recall? Well, I, I did a lot of work on the Susquehanna River, uh, both with aquatic insects and fishes when I was undergraduate because I st continued to work for the consulting firm uh, until I graduated, and then for when I went down to Virginia Tech. Uh, what my, Ken Dixon was my major professor, and we worked on um, the influence of uh, heated effluent from a fossil fuel plant on the New River, Virginia, on distribution and the impact on, on uh, fishes in the New River. And I did laboratory studies on temperature preference and avoidance, and I did a lot of field collecting uh, and found fish at different isotherms in New River, and, and then coordinated uh, the field and the uh, laboratory work to uh, complete my dissertation on the impact of temperature on fish behavior. Wow, that's really cool. So, what what would be the layman's abstract um, for your work? Like, what were your findings? Well, we found that, um, in fact, that most of the fish kills with um, Thermal heated effluence occurred in the wintertime, and this was discovered by many people other than me, but when they had cold water shutdowns of the, of the um, heated effluent and the fish were subjected to cold shock in the, in the uh, wintertime, it caused fish kills, and this was very, very rare. Uh, it didn't happen at all when I was studying the Glen Lynn facility. In the summertime, when the water got too warm, for the fishes, they uh, just avoided it. And again, the power company did not cause any fish kills in the summertime because the effluent got too warm for the fishes. They just moved out of the effluent and um, avoided it. And so because of their sensitivity to temperature and their temperature preference and temperature avoidance, the power company had minimal impact on the fishes of the New River. Oh, interesting. And that's true with most power facilities throughout the country. And when you found, um, so to go back, you said that when the temperature dropped, uh, when it got too cold, there would be fish killed. Was that correct? Right. Well, what would happen is the fish would come into the warm water effluents, and these uh, warm water effluents were roughly 10 degrees above the ambient temperature, and the fish would, would move into the warm water effluents, they'd become acclimated to those effluents, and then if the, the plant had a shutdown and it started taking ambient water through the plant, there was no war, water and the fish couldn't find any other warm water because it was the middle of winter time and it would cause a fish kill. But those are very rare occurrences, and like I say, it didn't happen at all at the Glen Lynn facility when I was studying it. Uh, but the fish kills do not usually occur in the summertime because of warm water. 
In fact, other people have done studies on fishes, and it turns out that uh, if you do collections in heated effluents in the summertime, you find a lot of sick fish in the effluents. The initial conclusion was that the effluent was making the fish sick. That is not true. The, the effluents, heated effluents, were collecting the sick fish in the system because fish are cold-blooded or peculiar therms, and so they, their body temperature is the same as their environmental temperature. And so when they became infected with bacteria or fungi or parasites, they would exhibit a, a behavioral fever and they would have a warmer uh, preference temperature, and so the sick fish would accumulate in the um, warm water effluents, and you discovered, in fact, that they had increased antibiotic production, increased white cell blood count, phagocytosis, and one could argue that the heated effluents was actually making sick fish well. That's not always the case, but um, certainly the heated effluents in many cases, they're not causing, are not making the fish sick. They're just collecting the sick fish in the system. Oh wow! And so the the fish that you're using for these studies to you know to to find out um, or to get these data points and, and to kind of formulate uh, your conclusions are they all? Uh, are you typically getting one species, or are you getting the broad spectrum for the most part of what would be normal in that river system? No, we collected, we have data on, on some 40 species of fishes from the New River when I was studying it. Okay, and then I would assume that depending on the species, some can tolerate the weather change more so than other, or do you tend to find that they all behave in a certain manner to the same to the t same temperature change? Uh, different species have different uh, requirements. Oh, gotcha. And, and just for my curiosity, what would wh what did you find to kind of be the hardiest species that we tend to have in our river system? Mostly in, in terms of temperature, uh, catfish species can withstand very warm temperatures, and also uh, some minnows and a lot of the um, some of the sunfish. The thing the thing to realize, however, is that um, when you say what fish are most tolerant, it depends on the stress you're talking about. Like if you were to ask people if brook trout or, or common carp, European carp, were more tolerant, most people would say that the carp were tolerant. Well, that is true if you're talking about low dissolved oxygen and sewage treatment plants and things like that. But if you're talking about um, low pH, brook trout are much more tolerant to low pH than carp. So when you talk about whether an aquatic organism, a fish in particular, is more tolerant, you need to know tolerant to what, it's depending on pH, temperature, low dissolved oxygen, whatever. Gotcha. So like all things in life, it depends, right? Right. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so to talk about some of uh, some of your areas of focus, um, it, it maybe there's an opportunity for you to you know uh, give an outreach, if you will, to some of the the home aquarists that listen to this podcast. So you have areas of interest that include endangered fishes. Uh, the freshwater fish behavior, and then the impact of introduced uh, fishes. So in, in any of your research, uh, any of your, of your findings, um, have you ever found like introduced tropical fish species uh, while you're doing any of your studies? Um, and in general, you know, to those home aquarists that, you know, this thought may pass their, you know, come across their mind or if they want to get out of the hobby and instead of turning their fishes over to a local fish store or another hobbyist, you know, introducing it into their local river or lake system. Right. Um, and I've done a fair amount of work uh, in Florida and then we've also done uh, some work here in the Susquehanna River on tropical fishes. One of the things that is a real problem is that kids, children, whatever, get aquaria and they buy tropical fish and their parents set it up and after a while they don't take care of the fish and they don't want to kill the fish so they go dump them in their local waterways. This is a huge mistake. Um, in Florida, in the canals, uh, a lot of the native fishes are no longer there because of the introduction of, the, of aquarium fishes. 
in Florida, in the Everglades, uh, most of the fishes are, in fact, uh, aquarium fishes and invasive species. We had a case here in the Susquehanna where they were um, trying to culture tilapia species for food fish, and I was against it in the warm water effluent of power plant. And they escaped, and in fact, they uh, occupied over 100 kilometers of the Susquehanna River, and these fishes overwintered in warm water effluents from paper companies, power plants, sewage treatment plants. And uh, we were able, in February, to successfully go back and eliminate these by turning off all the warm water effluents in the river. And we killed a lot of native fishes because of that cold shock that I talked about, but we got rid of the tilapian species, and um, we were successful in eliminating them. But in warmer climates, that is not going to happen. And so uh, now we have snakeheads. We have a lot of uh, fishes that are more cold tolerant in Pennsylvania that are invasive that probably got their start from um, the people with aquaria. And in Florida, it's a huge problem, as well as in Texas. Uh, so if you're doing something with aquarium fish or tropical fishes, don't release them into the environment, but in fact, uh, give them to somebody else or euthanize them in some way because once they get into the um, natural systems, they compete with native fishes and they're almost impossible to get uh, to eliminate. Yeah, I've seen um, some online pictures of in Florida the um, it looks like a, some common placostomus that have gotten to be you know a foot, two feet. You know they they get fairly large, um, and there's many of them on on manatees. Um, and so, right. from my understanding, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with this study, and maybe there's some more insight you can provide, but um, we don't know yet if there is a symbiotic relationship or if they're being parasitic to the manatees. I can't imagine the manatee enjoying that experience. But what, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't. I don't know any information about the manatees, but I know that, like in the, the walking catfish, is a huge problem uh, in the Everglades. And that's exasperated because they're taking so much water out of the water table that the other glades, instead of being a continuous sheet flow of water all summer long, now it is in isolated pools. And the walking catfish will eliminate all the native fishes in one pool and then get out of the water and climb to, and grow the land in the next pool and do the same thing. So there's a lot of interactions between these uh, native fishes um, the other thing, in, in Mexico, there's been some native fishes that have changed their behavior by being a vegetarian to being um, a carnivore. And this was linked to the fact that um, the aquarium fish that were released had a parasite into it, and the parasite invaded the native fish and changed the behavior of the native fish completely. Um, so you not only have the problem of uh, introduced fishes directly competing or preying upon uh, the indigenous fauna, but you also have the introduction of diseases and parasites. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's uh, I hadn't heard that one. And it, again, it just reinforces that idea that, you know, uh, as, as you've suggested, um, euthanize, uh, donate, uh, get rid of, you know, if you need to get rid of your aquarium fish, do it in a way that is... Um, ecologically responsible. Um, and another piece too, you know, I, I was aware of the, the snakehead problem that they have in Florida, um, which has become quite rampant and, uh, you know, knowing that snakeheads, that they can survive out of water for, uh, in what seems like an ungodly period of time for a fish. Um, and they kind of have that ability to wiggle themselves across land from one body of water to the next. So, uh, you know, very dangerous species to try to introduce, but I, I hadn't heard that they were in, up in Pennsylvania at this point. We have, we have snakeheads in Pennsylvania and in Maryland. In fact, it's a major predator in the lower Potomac River now. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're very uh, voracious fish. And I know from being a, a, a fish sportsman myself, and I've watched some videos of this, that, you know, there's guys that will fish specifically for them in the canals. And when they do catch them, they'll, they'll make sure that they keep them. Um, to keep them out of the water system, but yeah, they're absolutely voracious and they they will attack anything. It seems like indiscriminately. That's true. 
So one other uh, question that, I, that I've had for an ichthyologist, and I'm not sure how much you've done this in your experience, uh, but if you could shed light on the species description process. So, you know, as a home Aquarius, we all benefit from the work that ichthyologists do, and I know that there is some kind of back and forth where um, scientists do get some insight from the home Aquarius, and home Aquarius have made some very good discoveries, but in the realm of species description, um, can you walk through, I mean, at a high level, what, what that is about when we come across new species and, and what that process is to actually get that a formal scientific name? Sure, and I've done a lot of that in Malawi. I've been working in Malawi for 36 years, um, and we're describing lots of new species from Malawi. And I'll, let me go back just a second and talk about scientific names versus common names. And common names get to be a problem because in different parts of the country, you will have different common names for the same species. The scientific name ideally uh, will tell you a lot about the specimen uh, or the species. It'll tell you what it's closest related to, depending upon what genus it is. And it's all based on this Linnaean hierarchy that uh, you describe a species, you have to put it in a genus. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, you place it in the, in the correct genus, and it has to be placed in, in the correct family and order and all the way up through the Linnaean hierarchy. And this gives us information about the evolutionary history uh, of the, the species about which we are talking. The thing about describing the new species, first you have to recognize that it is, in fact, not uh, already been described. That is, in fact, an undescribed species. So you have to be familiar with the fauna a fish fauna from where you capture it. Uh, then you have to uh, determine how different it is from the other species, and in terms of terms of float around, depending whether you're a cladist or a numerical taxonomist, you have to look for distinguishing characteristics. These are called Alt-apomorphic, an apomorphic character is a derived character. So we have to find a character that is, in fact, unique to that species, or sometimes a suite of characters that's unique to that species. And you have to determine that for a particular genus, uh, a genus has what are called synapomorphies, which are shared, derived characters. And these are characters in which all members of the genus possess. Uh, and so if you're going to place it into a genus, you have to make sure that it's a correct genus. So once you determine these characters, and it's important to realize these characters can be genetic characters, they can be morphological characters, they can be behavioral characters. Um, one of the problems with describing fishes from Lake Malawi, there's more species of fish in Lake Malawi than any other freshwater lake in the, in the world. Uh, there's probably more species of fishes in Lake Malawi than all the fresh waters of the uh, North American continent. Uh, it's very difficult to tell these apart. Uh, and a lot of times you have to get underwater and look at behavior characters. If you took a, a large beach seine, for example, and uh, collected fish along the shoreline of Lake Malawi, it'd probably be fairly easy to to distinguish the males of the species, uh, there are some problems with that, but it'd be very difficult to distinguish the females. So when I'm describing a species of fish in Lake Malawi, I'm underwater with scuba gear, and I have a, a net that's about seven meters long, a meter deep, and half a centimeter mesh. And I watch a male that's breeding, and females will come in and breed with that male. As the female leaves, I capture that uh, female and put it in my bag I carry underwater. And after I capture about four or five females, then I capture the male. And so my premise is that the fish will make fewer mistakes in choosing the right species with which to spawn than I would just based on looking at them. So then... Once I collect a lot of fish from a breeding arena, I'm fairly certain that these are the same species. 
Then I look at my behavioral data to determine if that is different in behavior from closely related species. I look at morphology. Uh, sometimes I have other people look at the genetics to determine if they are, in fact, unique and if they want um, a, a new species description. And so then when you describe the species, uh, you have to place it in the right genus. Then you have to distinguish it and show that it's different from all other species in that genus. That's called a diagnosis. And then you have to have a list of characters that make this species unique and separate from all other species. When you select a name for that species, there's a couple of ways, three ways, in fact, that you can select a name. You can name it what's called a commemorative name after a person because you want to honor that person. For example, I, I described a deep water species of cichlid that was a pediophage. A pediophage is simply a baby eater. A phage means to eat pedia like a pediatrician, a baby, a baby doctor. And so this fish ate babies and it had an upturned mouth and uh, in fact, we found uh, young larval forms and eggs of other species in the stomach. And the first one to describe pediophagy or baby eating from Lake in Africa was Humphrey Greenwood. So I named the species, species Greenwood Eye after Humphrey Greenwood to honor him and his discovery. You can also name it... Um, because of a particular characteristic that the fish has. I described a fish from Lake Malawi that had a huge uh, clystrum, and you could actually see the shoulder girdle extend below the fish uh, external morphology. You could see the point of the clystrum. I named that fish macroclystrum to be indicate that it had a large clystrum. So you can name it with some characteristic of the fish, or you can name it where it was first um, caught, like the minnow species that were described. Uh, the Tropus hudsonius was first collected in the Hudson River, so they named it Hudsonius. So you can have a geographical name, you can have a uh, commemorative name, or you can have a name that's descriptive, tells something about uh, the fish. Um, so various ways you can uh, choose a name for the fish. And then you should publish it in a referee journal. That's not a requirement for the rules of zoological nomenclature. And in fact, a lot of aquarium species get described based on aquarium specimens and uh, based on several specimens. And a lot of the aquarium species that I've looked at, uh, you can have... Um, three or four different species in the same jar. Uh, when you describe the species, you name a holotype, and this is the type specimen that represents that species. And then all other specimens that are used in the original description are called para, P-A-R-A -A, types, paratypes. And so sometimes when you look at specimens uh, in a jar, the paratypes, you'll find several species in that jar based on a uh, aquarium specimens, and this again makes it very difficult. So although it's not a requirement uh, from the rules of zoological nomenclature, ideally it should be based on wild caught specimens. Um, and they, the other problem with describing fish based on aquarium is a lot of times the morphology uh, will change quite a bit if they're in artificial conditions than if they're wild caught specimens. Um, so that's a quick rundown of what has to be done to uh, identify a species. And like I say, uh, you should accumulate any life history information, uh, basic biological information, when the species spawned, uh, how large it gets. Any of that information is useful in the original species description. But again, that's not uh, necessarily required. Wow, Dr. Stafford, that was, uh, you say that that was a quick rundown, but that seemed very um, in-depth to me and very informative 
Um, so thank you very much for, for going through that. And I'm, I'm definitely more informed now. Um, but of course, I do have some, some questions for you, though, from that. Uh, so I, I guess genetics. I, I mean, I am certainly no geneticist. I'm a, uh, I'm a business supply chain guy. So help me understand, now, now that you have the ability um, to look at genomes and the fish genetics, is it incorrect to assume that you know you could just use genetics genetics one hundred percent of the time um and and be able to identify species based on just genetic profiles sure um I think that people would argue with me okay this is my opinion uh I think that's a bad thing to do uh I think that you need to know something about the critter itself uh the Lake Malawi fauna is so so recently evolved that a lot of times the, that you find behavioral differences in which you have a sort of mating, and when you look at different species, you can have what are called post mating isolating mechanisms. These are the fact if they interbreed with a, another species, the embryo dies; it does not develop. Or if the embryo survives, you get a hybrid that may uh, be sterile. The best example with which most people are familiar, you can cross a donkey and a horse and you get a mule. They do that because mules are strong. Uh, they can do a lot more work than a horse or a donkey, but they're sterile. They can't reproduce. So that's a post-mating isolating mechanism that uh, people use to designate species. There are also pre-mating isolating mechanisms, and Lake Malawi has many examples of this, where that if you take two species and put them in a male of one species and a female of another species in an aquaria, they will produce and produce viable offspring that can breed. Um, but if you look in their natural environment, they assortatively mate, and they don't choose members of the, a different species with which to mate. Um, if you look at uh, the red top zebras in Lake Malawi, for example, I described three different species, and uh, very difficult to distinguish them, tell them apart. And a colleague of mine, uh, George Turner, looked at them in, in Britain and found that if he took males of one species and females of another, they would uh, interbreed and produce viable offspring. But it, he put them all in essentially indoor swimming pools and put males and females from all populations in there, there was 100% assorted mating that they didn't uh, crossbreed. Uh, and so it was very difficult to find out characters that would separate these. Uh, a colleague of mine at Cornell University studies retinas of eyes, and we looked at these fish, or he looked at them, and they had ret uh, cones, color cells in the retinas of the eyes that were sensitive to UV light. And we lit these males up under black light and videoed them with UV sensitive um, videotapes. And in fact, the males were quite, dis quite different from one another. And the females I could see in the UV light spectrum could tell them apart, even though when I was looking at them in an aquarium, I couldn't tell them apart. Um, so a lot of times I think you have to use a combination of behavior, genetics, and morphology in order to distinguish forms, especially if they're recently, um, speciated. Uh, a lot of times geneticists will use mitochondrial DNA. That's for the most part is passed down only through the mother. Uh, and again, it provides extremely useful information on timelines, and uh, we can get a phylogenetic history of it. And genetic work has just has allowed us to make conclusions about species that we couldn't make before that. They can identify some species that morphology and uh, behavior can't distinguish, but at the same time, I think it's a mistake to uh, rely entirely on genetic information and not take into consideration the morphological and the um, behavioral data that you can obtain. Yeah, thank you very much for that answer. And I, and I definitely, um, you know, directionally, 
I agree with you completely that, you know, to me, it, it, it would seem remiss, right? It would seem like you were just, you're just fundamentally missing out something in the scientific experience of only relying on one of those, especially it being the genetic aspect of it. And you're missing out on the, on the physical characteristics and the behavioral characteristics. So um, that was just the thought that popped in my head and I was curious on. So thank you very much for the answer. Um, and the other one that I, uh, one of the other questions I should say I have is the the use of Greek versus Latin. So one of the things that I'm personally trying to do is when I, one, I'm trying to know at least the Latin names or the scientific names, I should say, of the fish that I'm keeping or the fish that I'm interested in. Um, and then what I'm coming across is, right, there's sometimes a mix between Latin and Greek being used. Um, and so then I'm trying to take it to the next step of, um, understanding exactly like you explained with the uh, the baby eater, the uh, the pettiophage, uh, pettiphage, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, uh, of understanding you know what that name is, what the root words uh, actually mean, so that you have a better understanding of of the of what the fish actually is, um, which is kind of you know paying homage to the work that you do as an ichthyologist to describe the species. I mean, you you gave it this name uh, for a reason as kind of a description. Um, so to me, I, again, I feel remiss not knowing that. So you, what's your take on Latin versus Greek word usage? Okay. Um, I'm glad to answer that, but if I could, if you don't mind, if I could back step, uh, for when you, oh, of course. About the, when you're talking about genetics and morphology, that the morphological information also has a very practical use, especially, um, for example, in North America, because like in Pennsylvania, we have different size limits on different species and uh, different seasons when you're allowed to catch a different species. And so unless you have morphological differences where fishermen, uh, fish wardens, and things can distinguish the species based on morphological, it'd be an impossible to enforce some of these regulations or even to make some of these regulations in the beginning. So it has a very practical uh, reason that you need the morphological data just on uh, fisheries management and fishery science and and uh, practical means about uh, whether the, the catch of a particular fisherman is legal or is out of season or too small or too big or whatever. So I just wanted to point that out, but that the practical implications of the morphological data. Um, but now going back to your question, um, when you, Linnaeus in his, his uh, 13th edition of Systema de Natura, uh, that is a, the ground zero for scientific names. Any name that was used before that is invalid. Uh, any name that has priority uh, is the valid name. So if two species are named with different names and one was earlier, one was in 1902 and the other one was in 1926, the one in 1902 has priority. As long as it is named is after um, the publication of Linnaeus's work, uh, his 13th edition. And so then, ideally, you would have um, the names are either in Greek or in Latin. And uh, ideally, if the generic name is in Latin, then the specific epitaph that you use should also be in Latin. Consequently, if the, specific, if the generic name is in Greek, ideally, the specific name should also be in Greek. Now, this cannot always happen, and it gets changed because um, a lot of times systematists and taxonomists, they will move different um, species to different genera because as they get more information, they find out that species A does not belong into this genus. It belongs into a different genus. And so when it does that, then the... Um, specific name goes along with it uh, and stays the same even though if it was originally described in a Latin genus and then put in a Greek genus. So that name remains the same. Now, if it is an adjective, it must also agree in 
gender. So if the generic name is masculine, then the specific name has to be masculine, unless it's a noun. If it's a noun, it doesn't have to be, but if it's an adjective. For example, uh, a North American minnow, Atropus spalacris, was uh, described originally and was in the genus Notropus, uh, was put in a, another genus before that, but it was in genus Spilocris, and then uh, it was placed in another genus, which was a subgenus called Cipronella. So when Spilocris was moved from Notropus to Cipronella, then the specific name changed from Spilocris to Spilocra because it had to agree in gender. Um, and so it gets confusing, and uh, you can, whenever you describe a species, uh, in, diff in addition to the diagnosis and the description I talked about uh, earlier, there's an, also an etymology which explains why you chose the name and the origin of the name, uh, whether it's a combination of two Latin words to describe the name, uh, or it's named after somebody and that name has been Latinized or whatever. Uh, and I know it can become confusing, but in the long run, it's not nearly as confusing as using only uh, common names. For example, if you talk about the largemouth bass and the smallmouth bass and the rock bass and the striped bass, uh, the striped bass is in a different uh, genus completely than the largemouth bass, but the largemouth bass and the smallmouth bass are in the same genus. So just because they have bass as a common name doesn't mean that they're close related. But the fact that the largemouth bass and the smallmouth bass are in the genus Microptors does mean that they're more closely related than to the rock bass, which is in the genus Amblyplides. Yes, so I don't know if that answers your question. No, but. no, no definitely. It's, it's fantastic insight, and, and, and it just makes me want to say that, you know, you have to do, um, you know, you've built up this body of knowledge in the field of ichthyology and the, and the specialty areas that you focused in. Um, you know, you go out there, you do all your research, and, you know, you're, you're putting in all this work for species description and, you know, doing the laundry list of activities that you've described um, it, to describe a species. And then on top of that, you've got this extra layer of, okay, now we have to make sure that it conforms to all of the standard naming uh, conventions out there. So, um, I mean, that's, it, it's just an extra layer and definitely something as a home hobbyist that I appreciate because, again, you know, you're out there uh, discovering and, and describing these new species. So, uh, yeah, just uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of work and I would assume a labor of love. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that, but I love what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then I guess if you were to describe or if you were to, to come across a completely new species that would need its own new genus, is it just kind of a coin toss at that point of what, uh, since you now have the opportunity to name the genus, if you want to go Latin or Greek? Yes. Oh, okay. And I've named some genera I pick Greek and some I pick Latin on the new gender I've described. It was just depending on, you know, what kind of cuisine you were more into that day or just, like, what, just a coin Yeah, and it's, if, if the closely related genera are in Greek, then I choose a Greek just because I think that's the right thing to do. But there's no rules that say you have to do that. Gotcha, okay. And so I guess my, my last question then for you, um, because I think we may be kind of running up on the time ceiling here, is on, is on disputes. Um, and the approval of, of a name. So, you know, Dr. Stoffer, you're out there. You're very well respected. You know, you've got the title of a distinguished professor. So for me, I would, uh, you know, I would take your word as gospel that if you put research in and you said, you know, here, here are all the characteristics of this particular new species. This is what I'm going to name it. But, you know, who, who gives the, the green stamp of approval to say, yep, Dr. Stoffer, your work is good. We, as the body of people that name species, approve your name. And then on the same note, how do the disputes come about um, to get names changed? Okay, well, um, so I, if I describe several species, when I was talking about that whole thing, I said that I'd encourage you to publish it in a referee journal. So when I submit it to a journal, another scientist um, 
the editor of the journal picks several people for to review uh, my paper and they review my methods and my techniques and my literature review. Did I miss any literature? Uh, whatever. Uh, has this species ever been described before? And then they make a recommendation to the editor whether it should be published or not. Now then, as for that all goes into the fact whether I'm correct that it's a different species or a new species. Okay, but um, in terms of what name I give it, as long as it uh, follows the rules of uh, rules of nomenclature, I can pick almost any name I want. Uh, I can name it after somebody. I can name it after a place where it was collected. Um, I can't use the same name in zoology if that name has been used in that genus. But if it's been used in a different family or different genus, I can. In botany, you can't. The specific name has to, in fact, be unique. And in zoology, the generic name has to be unique. Like you can't decide a generic name for a fish if that generic name has been used for uh, a worm, for example. Uh, so that has to be unique. And then, um, and a lot of times, uh, you, you make recommendations and I follow reviewers' comments and if I satisfy their comments and the editors, then it gets published. Now, there have been times when um, you may have published a species and you find out that this species has already been described, for example, in a German occurs literature, which I didn't know about. So then uh, somebody writes a paper and say that that uh, this species has been described and previously it's been given the name of whatever, and then that name has priority and the species is referred to from that name, and the name that I chose is what's called a junior synonym. So that's not um, required anymore. So then in terms of uh, Thinking a name, there was one situation where I described uh, a species of fish. I found that it had been described already before, and I collected it. But when I compared the wild caught specimens to the um, type specimens that were used in the original description, they they were different. They 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 weren't the same. And I found out later that the people that described that species had based it on uh, aquarium specimens, and aquarium specimens were hybrids, and it wasn't a, a unique species. Now, I could have given it a different name, but because of a lot of other papers that have been published on this species using the original name, then um, I petitioned the... Uh, committee on Zoological Nomenclature to retain the same name of that species. I didn't think the name, uh, and I gave all my reasons of why the name should be retained because it would be uh, more useful to retain that name than to give it a different name at this time. Uh, but you could have just as easily given it a different name and saying that their name was invalid uh, because they described a hybrid, they didn't describe a valid species, and they just guessed at the type locality. They didn't really collect the specimens from that locality. Wow. So the the committee of zoological naming then is that um, uh, is that a global body? And how are the representatives? It's a global body. Okay. There's people from on that committee from all over the world. Yes. Okay. And so that would then kind of be the authority on once your paper gets published and and approved on you know writing the, you know, writing, if you will, um, for lack of a better word, that name into the, the annals of zoological naming? Well, no, they, they, don't, they don't approve or disapprove it. Other scientists would say disapprove it, and they would write a paper, and then if they submitted a paper to the journal, uh, the bulletin of zoological nomenclature, then that committee would rule on that they would uh, ask opinions from throughout the scientific community. Once they gathered those opinions, they make a decision. But they don't they don't make a decision on every new species that's been described, but only in those cases where 
I assume other scientists or taxonomists would question it and publish data. Uh, and usually, if uh, somebody would uh, decide that the species that I named is not valid, they would publish a paper in a journal saying my species is not valid. And then, uh, since that was published after my description, that would be the uh, the authority that that publication and it would stand like that until unless I disagreed with them I'd publish another paper and say no they were wrong and so it's it's all a matter of uh, most recent publications that really decide upon which name is valid gotcha and other scientists in the group gotcha dr. Stoffer, uh, I want to thank you very much for all your time and, and just fantastic insight in, into you know your history your um, progression uh, to to become an ichthyologist and your experiences, you know, naming uh, and the research that you've done and also the description and naming of fish. I do have one last quick question. So I know that you've collaborated with Odd Konings. Um, he's actually speaking tonight at the Seattle Fish Club that I'm a member of, and I'll be attending that that talk. Are there any stumping questions that I should ask him that uh, <laughs> you know to play a practical joke on him or anything? <laughs> Odd Konings has forgotten more about cichlids than I know, and he's a <laughs> A very dear friend, and we do a lot of research together, and he, you're very, very blessed to have him give a talk. His talks are fantastic. Uh, I have him give a talk almost every year to my ichthyology class, and, and tell him that we talk and tell him that I send my regards, and he is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I, I will do definitely, and I'm I'm incredibly excited. I'm very much looking forward to uh, to his talk uh, tonight. Um, so, Dr. Stoffer, thank you very much again. Uh, you know, I hope in the future I can have you on. Uh, you know, at least one or two more times. I mean, you know, your 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 knowledge, your body of knowledge is so extensive, and there's so many topics that uh, you know that that you've researched on that um, we didn't even we didn't uh, we couldn't cover in a in a 40 minute interview. So. Thank you very much again for your time. I hope the rest of your day is fantastic. Um, and again, I appreciate your time, sir. Sure thing. Do you take care? All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you again for listening to the Aquarius Podcast. As always, get involved in your local fish club, help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds.